So how have you been, Dimitri? I've been good. I know I haven't uh, graced the show recently in the last uh, month now, yeah. I guess. But uh, I was doing a little bit of traveling, you know, um, trading markets as always. But yeah. uh, So what have, you, uh, what have you been seeing in the markets? What have you been buying? What have you been making money on? <laughs> Well, um, I think last time we chatted, I was buying those Kronos puts. Right. And so I think we kind of chatted a little bit about that trade. So I, I closed out half of the position at a profit, like mm -hmm. a two point something X profit, which mm. covered my uh, initial cost. And then I kind of let the rest ride. And Kronos, it, it hung in there. And so that kind of remainder, I sold off for a couple of pennies. So on the net, it was you know a positive trade. But if, um, if we had a little bit less market support from the S&P 500 and all that could have been a great trade. Hmm. Um, but generally now I'm just sort of looking in terms of uh, um, undervalued names, story names. So something um, we can talk about as well is just the rec rollout that's coming in Ontario. And there's a couple of names there mm -hmm. that are uh, potentially interesting. And I think the market up until recently hasn't really been paying much attention to them. So th there's those kind of names. And like uh, who are you speaking about specifically? Like you guys, I think you guys had them uh, last week, National Access Cannabis, okay. uh, Fire and Flower, uh, Chum, Alcana. So I think, I think um, there's a s supply issue in terms of Canadian cannabis, but it's, it's on the retail side and it's on the product side. It's not on the actual production side. So that's where I think a lot of the margins are going to be captured. Hmm. So you think that the uh, cannabis shortage is materializing? Well, I think the cannabis shortage is in terms of certain specific products. So okay. the LPs w with their genetics, they don't know exactly what consumers are going to be going for. And what I've seen so far from my due diligence and online and otherwise, it's people want high quality bud mm -hmm. and they also want high CBD oils or high THC as well. Um, but high, the high CBD uh, is a big one. So I don't know if that's similar to what you've seen, but um, also just a lot of criticism of some of the LPs, how they're packaging some of their product right. as well. So I think, it, I think StatsCan just released yesterday, um, you know, inventories on the balance sheets of these LPs, they're rising. Mm -hmm. Unfinished goods, everything's rising. So there's, and then there's a couple of LPs that just got their licenses and all this. So there's going to be lots of weed. There's going to be lots of cannabis. But it's about having the channel that can capture the actual margin, which I don't believe is the LPs, which I believe right. is the downstream, and having the right product mix. Hmm. Cool. So what did you go look at in Colombia? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, I mean, I almost got to look at uh, Chiron's facility. That, that was, uh, right. could have been cool. But um, actually, I saw some other LPs that were down there. Colombia is a very interesting place. Um, Anything advanced? Uh, yeah, actually, I went to, um, so I haven't seen the Chiron facility. I just, just seen videos and, you know, right. talk to people. But I went to an LP called Avicana, actually. Oh, okay. And I like to just shout out. They were very gracious. They let me uh, tour the facility with a few friends of mine. Mm -hmm. um, and I think they're, I was very impressed. Um, they're building out um, a bunch of outdoor sort of greenhouse type uh, designs. Uh, I met with their, you know, lab uh, and technical team there. So something... And I've also talked with a number of lawyers actually on the ground and consultants uh, outside of Avicana. And so what I'll tell you about the Colombian market is, I think exports are the big sort of uh, golden goose there, right? Okay. Colombia is the, the cheapest and one of the you know, op countries that's really open to um, exporting oil. Right. right. So extracts is extracts. Mm. Oil for extract is going to be big there. Yeah, it's like five, ten cents a gram. And and honestly, longer term, once you have more legalization globally, you got to think about the cost structure. Right. Right. So obviously, there's synthetic cannabis and all that. We can talk about you know down the line. But uh, from a cost perspective, Colombia and other jurisdictions like that are very important. The the problem though is right now um, there's there's a lot of regulatory sort of um, hurdles and, and hoops these LPs have to jump in. Mm. And there's actually dozens of them, hmm. I would say, uh, in Colombia itself. Hmm. So there's only two uh, currently public, which are Farmacello and uh, Chiron, as, as far as I know. Right. Um, but point is, the way I see it is three stages. One, get through the government hurdles and all of that. Two, extraction bottlenecks. So you're going to be able to grow as much as you want in terms of flour. Uh, it's, it's not hard, but it's just getting the actual extraction throughput and having the right people, the right team, uh, that knows how to do that 
that's important. And then three, partnerships in terms of export, like where are you actually going to send this? Where's the market for this? And it's not just oil, that's a very generic term, right? There's uh, CBD isolate, which is a specific sort of uh, end product, like the resin, you have the full spectrum, and you have different you know, uh, mixes uh, and cannabinoids as well, right, that mm -hmm. are very valuable. Right, so what do you make of, uh, you know, so Peru has just gone medically legal. Mm -hmm. um, not in America is opening up generally. Uh, Brazil is obviously the biggest market there. Though I, I find it interesting when people say Latin America and they include Brazil without having actually made any moves towards Brazil. You may as well be in Africa when you're in Brazil in terms of how similar it is to the business environment of the rest of Latin America. But so do you think that there's, uh, you know, is it, is it reasonable to expect uh, continent-wide distribution from what you've seen in Colombia so far? Um, I'm not too bullish on the Latin American story specifically and the reason why is um, I think it's really cheap to produce and I think a lot of just uh, citizens, normal people are probably growing it, um, you know, um, and it's not a particularly rich continent either. So average incomes around the area are like five, six hundred dollars USD, mm -hmm. right? So if you're selling a product and you want to make a margin, right, that might be a little bit tough. Um, I'm not saying there isn't a market, there is. But uh, maybe the sizing is, is a big debate, I think, until we see some uh, numbers over the next couple of quarters. But I think uh, Colombia's position as a growing you know, hub um, and the sort of regulatory um, leaps that they've made there, mm -hmm. uh, I think is very positive for sure. Okay. Um, the large cap uh, cannabis stocks have essentially been in a you know, sort of this equilibrium phase as uh, mm -hmm. our charting man Dan was describing it, where it's kind of, you know, the, the range, the volatility range is sort of narrowed as it tries to find its price equilibrium as he described it. Um, but then we're seeing entities like Aurora, who obviously had what you would call the macro catalyst of Nelson and Peltz, mm -hmm. add $2 billion in market cap to the stock almost overnight in two or mm -hmm. three trading sessions. Um, do you think that the lift in Aurora's share price is a reflection on the kind of deal flow that Nelson Peltz is going to bring to the table? Um, I think it's a lot of things. It's, it's definitely, uh, Nelson Peltz is very well known on Wall Street. He's a big name there. Um, I'm sort of neutral on the, on the whole uh, tr transaction, I guess you could say. Mm -hmm. On the one hand, uh, great advisor and, you know, I've seen a bunch of his interviews, very impressive guy. Um, at the, at the same time, he also got you know two hundred million dollars of notional, you know options that are vested over four years with or without transactions, whatever. I'm sure if you were given that kind of deal, and you know you're a connected guy too, I'm sure you would take it, right? Yes. For some reason, Aurora has not offered no. me <laughs> ten million <laughs> options. So I guess million, not, I think it's nineteen million actually. <laughs> that was the incorrect headline. Oh, is that right? Um, okay, so then in terms of the option trades, where are you finding fertile ground? Where are you, where are you seeing less fertile ground? Yeah, so I mean, you mentioned an equilibrium and just generally speaking, um, what I've been doing and it's, it's worked, uh, covered calls generally speaking, but also since these names are just going sideways, it's a little dangerous, but you can write calls and puts. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're in essence shorting cannabis volatility, right? So I've been kind of doing that. Um, I, I don't. I wouldn't say I, I have too large of a position um, on it, on those kind of on those kind of trades, but uh, yeah, I'm just sort of waiting and seeing. Um, I think there is an issue in terms of uh, supply, and I think some of these quarterly revenues of some of these companies are going to be very disappointing this year. Mm -hmm. um, but that remains to be seen in terms of uh, where that's going to be uh, coming from. Sure. So of all of the uh, large cap mm -hmm. companies, we've got our Canadian large caps. We've got our uh, U.S. multi-state oper uh, uh, operator mm -hmm. large caps. Where do you see um, where do you see the, where do you see the trade for 2019? Yeah, I think Canada's you know dr dried out in terms of trade opportunities in the large cap space. Mm. That's just my view. Um, I think U.S. is where you want to be. I've said this multiple times, and the reason is. Um, you know, until Canopy and Aurora can actually go in there, I know they have CBD and all that, uh, hemp, right, Farm Bill, but um, until they can actually go in there, um, it's, it's, the value is just really Canada and the small smidge of international that exists right now. Mm -hmm. um, 
the U.S. market is large. It's going to be the biggest, you know, nominally group, um, growth in the next five, ten years, right? And there's actually, you can actually see regulatory change happening on the ground in lots of states, whereas in Europe, for example, I think it's a lot slower. Other parts of the world, it's a lot slower relative to a bunch of uh, the U.S. states. So I also think that um, it, it, might, it might reach a point where the, the U.S. MSOs are so established that some of these larger Canadian operators will have you know, nothing better than to acquire some of them. Hmm. So like, let's say... Canadians acquiring Americans. Yeah, maybe. I mean, it, it depends, right? If uh, this, you know, the States Act goes through and they can actually get financing, maybe they'll just be a standalone entity and uh, uh, maybe you know, market dynamics will shift. Wow. Uh, I, know, I mean, like Aurora is the number one uh, held stock on Robinhood right now. So there's a bunch of U.S. investors propping up. Uh, What's uh, Robinhood? Robinhood. It's like a brokerage um, app for. There's no transaction fees. It's very popular with millennials. Oh, okay. My, my ilk, supposedly, right? Right. Um, so you have. So Robinhood is an app where you can buy and trade stocks for no no fees. Um, yeah, we can get into that, but it's it's just very popular with m millennials, and it's uh, uh, they actually have statistics. I because see. of the fees, oh. amongst other things. It's, it's a very simplistic so app. Millennials are cheap? Uh, we have not a lot of money to go around after uh, you know, salaries after are down tuition. and you have debts, you have tuition right, debts. Right. Uh, that's an issue. Very cool. I'll have to check that out. Okay, so then, um, I mean, if we are going into the sort of drifting downward doldrums of the summer, pre-summer mm -hmm. and summer, where nothing happens absent the macro catalyst in the marketplace. How do you play that from a option trading perspective? Well, honestly, the portfolios I have right now, I do have a couple stocks that I'm long. So what I would be doing is maybe writing calls on the HMMJ, which is the ETF, mm -hmm. right? And so the trade there is, I think I'm a good stock picker, right? And so my stocks will go up, whereas you know the constituents of HMMJ on the net, right, will actually go down. Um, and that's just, and I mean, it's it's a little different too because a bunch of the stocks that I hold aren't even in the HMMJ, like the, you know, um, Ianthus and other right. US MSOs, right? Um, so that's one kind of trade. I think um, this is more of like the cannabis market right now, I think is a reflection of the extremely strong S&P we've had. We've had, by some accounts, like a, you know, record-breaking rally in terms of being, you know, a quarter ago at 23.50, and now we're at 28.50 practically. That's an incredible amount uh, of, of S&P points to rally in, a, in just a quarter. So I think that's really sort of brought out the animal spirits and the risk on sentiment, and not just in cannabis, on, in all uh, speculative and you know, tech stocks, everything's really come back. Mm -hmm. And so from the standpoint of fundamentals, why, why is the... Con why was, are you trying to get rid of us in the control room there? They just plates. And why? What is the fundamental reason that the uh, S and P continues to power higher despite mm. all these macroeconomic sort of risks, especially mm -hmm. uh, you know Brexit, etc., U.S. Yeah. China trade war. Those those seem to persist. They don't seem to yeah. be going away. No one cares about Brexit. Just just FYI. Really? Nobody literally like it's it's maybe for the British pound and British assets. That's about it. And some uh, companies that might be exposed to it, but it's very small hmm. in terms of a risk. And I think just recently they had the vote, and everyone's uh, pricing out the the fact that there's going to be a hard Brexit. Uh, the main reason is Powell, right? We talked about Powell four months ago, remember? Yes. And uh, he's the one that you know, was talking about rates being higher, and now he's totally. Uh, you know, paused, yes. the big foul, uh, Powell pause, and then he's also talking about stopping balance sheet unwind and they, by the end of this year, so the mm. quantitative tightening, if you Maybe they'll recall. start buying again if things get too ugly. Yeah, well, we'll, we'll, have, to, we'll have to see, but it's, um, it's, he's gotten, I think, a lot of criticism because um, economic data, was, there wasn't really enough time over two months for economic data to really filter in, and you know, the S&P drops a bit and he panics and he says, okay, okay guys, I'm not going to tighten, we're going to undo this, we're going to, mm. and so the market's like, wow, we have this Powell put, we have you know, this guy, right. speaking of options, right, protecting our downside, so why not just bid up risk assets? Every yep. time they go down, he just saves this. Yet another financial, or another Fed governor who watches the stock market, and any time the S&P dives, he backs up the and it doesn't help to be under in implied threat from Donald Trump. Right. Interesting. All right, we uh, have to leave it there for now, I think, because uh, they keep, I get the sense <laughs> that we've gone more than our 10-minute time. But, Dimitri, thanks again for yeah. joining us, and we'll see you again very soon.